Hello, 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 my lovely people, and welcome back to Addie's World. My name is Aideen. If you've been here before, thank you so much for coming back. If not, and this is your first time, sit down, relax, grab a drink. Stay to the end of the video. If you like what you see, maybe think about hitting the subscribe button and making sure your bell is on for all upcoming notifications. Okay guys, we are eventually and finally back with our True Crime Thursdays. It's been a while. Purely within lockdown, I just felt like I couldn't research murder. It was depressing enough in lockdown. But now that we are out, we're good to go. So guys, what I'm gonna do is I am gonna take you back to the 3rd of May, 2019. Not that far back. And around 3, 3.30 in the afternoon, a woman by the name of Carol Gould received a phone call from her husband, Matt telling her to get home, to drive safely, but to make sure she got home. Their daughter Ellie had had an accident, but to please come home. On the drive home, Carol noticed the emergency services, police, ambulance, all passing her by. And when she got to the end of her road, both police cars and ambulances were all abandoned and she could see yellow crime scene tape up. She eventually just abandoned her car and found her husband Matt outside her house. Found him hysterical. When she asked him what was wrong or what had happened, he re his reply was, Ellie has died. So guys, today we're gonna to talk about the murder of a 17 year old schoolgirl, Ellie Rose Gould. Okay guys, so. Ellie. We're going to take it back to the very start about Ellie. Ellie was born on the 6th of February 2002 to her parents Carol and Matt and her brother Ben. Ellie was said to have been feisty, loving, always laughing, always bubbly and had a love for horse riding. They lived in a small kind of suburb called Cane in Wiltshire which was this beautiful, idyllic countryside, very quiet, very small population. And it was here they had lived for, her parents had lived there for 20 years. It was a small community, kind of everyone really knew everyone. Ellie herself had the same group of friends. They were very, very close. She had a cousin and a very, she had the same group of friends basically all the way through school, all the way up into what I know as secondary school, American high school, everything like that. So they had a big group of friends, both girls and boys. And when they got to sixth form, which to me is maybe their leaving year, when they do their exams to go to leaving year, Ellie started dating one of the guys in the group named Thomas Griffith. Now, Thomas himself was also 17 at the time. He was from a very, he was, he was played rugby and he was from one of the local kind of suburbs around called Derry Hill. Um, their friend, Ellie's friend said, they had always kind of fancied each other. They liked each other growing up. It was kind of, oh, do I like him? Does he like me kind of thing. But when they got to sixth form, they officially started dating. So they had started dating, they said they started dating for three months, so I'm taking it maybe around the end of January, start of February, they made it official as a couple. But Ellie herself was so independent and so loving, so out there, she was like, mm, I don't know if I technically want to be in a relationship. I have my education to think of, I have my own friends to think of. So it was said on the 2nd of May, the night before Ellie was found dead, she had ended her relationship with Thomas and she had then texted her friends after talking about how she was free and not i don't think any way it talking about being free was in a malicious way i think she was just she had done that that was her first love that was it she was happy to move on to other things to be educated to to move on to grow up she was nearly at a stage that she was just about to leave home to go to college so yeah, she was ready for another change in her life. So that happened on the 2nd of May. On the 3rd of May, there's an interview with her mom and her mom said it was a typical morning. Uh, she was getting ready for work and Ellie was sitting down having cereal, having her breakfast. Um, she would normally have been at school, but because they were coming up to exam time period, a lot of the mornings or a lot of free classes were used for study. So Ellie had said, I'm actually gonna revise at home and then get a lift in later to my history class with another friend named Ellie. It can get confusing, but there's two Ellies. So Ellie, her friend, was going to give her a lift. Now, that morning, the friend who was giving her a lift, Ellie, she said around half 11-ish, half 11-ish, she actually received a message from Ellie Gould at around half 11 saying, you know what, I'm happy enough to study at home. It's not like we're going to be doing anything but today, but revising, which is true. When it gets to that, you're just kind of left to study anyway. So it was a plausible excuse. And Ellie, the friend, thought not enough. She just said she just didn't want to lift in, 
that was fine she was happy to revise at home and nothing else was thought about until Ellie's father Matt came home and the scene he walked into was horrendous it was Ellie face down at the table a knife from her left uh, a knife with her right hand was strewn across her body there was blood everywhere and obviously if your parents walking in on this scene Matt reacted as in dialing the emergency services getting in contact with the neighbors and getting everything sorted that way phoning his wife not panicking her but telling her to come home there had been an accident not really telling him are not really telling her the extent of what he had seen. Okay, so the placement of Ellie's body was very suspicious. Although she had 13 stab wounds, the knife and her hand were leaning across almost to stage the incident, the scene like she had committed suicide herself. And it was said, her mom I've seen in interviews were saying, oh, you know, I tried to justify it in my head. I was saying, maybe she got up on a counter, she hit her head and fell. Cause she obviously hadn't seen the scene where, until, until her husband eventually said, no, Carl, there was just too much blood. It wasn't something simple. And from there, they were kind of informed. They were taken to the police station. And from there, they were informed that they were going to start a homicide investigation. And they were just like, from thinking your child died through an accident to going to a homicide, they were like, what the hell happened our daughter? So the police were kind of, they when the first responders arrived there, they tried to administer CPR, kind of life-saving tactics. But the senior investigating officer, by the name, a man named Jim Taylor, was also said that by the extent of her wounds, even a skilled surgeon wouldn't have been able to do much so the first responders unfortunately were not able to resuscitate or help in any which way and from here Jim Taylor decided that yeah we need to start a serious investigation into this because even though it was staged as a suicide the 13 wounds on Ellie's body she wouldn't have done herself if it was a suicide if there was a main goal and second of all the neighbor had noticed a male visitor to the house. Didn't see his face, but it was a slim build male. So from here, the police decided, I think it's time we talk to all Ellie's friends and see what was going on in her life. See, was there any reason that they could suspect it was a suicide? Or was she having any difficulties with anyone in her life that maybe could have done this? And from here, after talking to Ellie's friends, Thomas Griffith not only became a person of interest, he actually became the person of interest. Um, from interviewing her friends and kind of doing a rough interview with Thomas, some of the police officers know he had fresh scratch marks around his neck. And one of her friends who was talking to Thomas that morning, Thomas had kind of alluded that he had self-harmed. He was feeling so stressed in his life. Him and Ellie were on a break and he was starting to self-harm aka he was starting to scratch his neck now i have not even read to wave but if you're already coming up to an excuse as why you have marks onto your neck the police ain't stupid son but once when the friend was talking to tom at this stage she was also taking screenshots of all he was saying and like maybe relaying relaying it back to ellie like this is what he's doing to himself this is what's happening and for some unknown reason she doesn't know why she actually went on to snap maps at the time he was sending these messages and noticed the bold Thomas was in the vicinity of Ellie's house and from there she just assumed before she, she knew anything had happened to Ellie she was like he's gone over now to maybe say to her you know listen let's give it another chance let's do this so she could pinpoint him being at Ellie's house around the time of the murder so yeah, but as I say, he prefaced it by saying, I started to self-harm, you'll notice I have scratches on my neck. Maybe Ellie fought back and um, he tried to come up with an excuse. When the police eventually got to interview Thomas, um, the first thing he said to them was, is my ex-girlfriend okay? I haven't heard from her all day. The police just found that odd because they were like, it wasn't known that something had happened to Ellie. Like they were going to their friends, but it was kept very, hush hush at the time so they were like first of all we're bringing you in to talk and it wasn't they never told him why they were wanted to talk to him so for him to say this was the first thing you're just like here son you're giving yourself away uh tom 
Tom decided, Tom went with the story that he'd been home studying all day, that he actually went, his mum dropped him off at school. Um, immediately after she dropped him off, he said he felt sick and there is footage of him getting on a bus to go home. Um, his mum arrived back to the house around 10.45. She didn't know Thomas was there because he said he hid from his mother because he didn't want to, her to know that he could come home from school. But if you were sick, surely you would tell your mum, like, mum, I came home, I'm sick. So the police were starting to poke holes in Tom's story. Yeah, because Tom, Tom's story of his day was his mum had dropped him to school, he'd felt sick, he came home. His mum arrived back at 10.45. He hid from her because he didn't want her to know she was home. Then he was talking to one of the neighbours and they noticed the scratch marks on his neck and he asked them for a lift back to school and when he was in school he sent a snapchat around to all his friends saying I'm finding it very stressful, I have a family member sick, I have started to self-harming, I'm going to speak to the nurse. So kind of Tom's story wasn't adding up per se. So from there then they decided, they the police decided they would actually check out his digital footprint and this was kind of a major break in the case because what they found is when Tom was home after he left school and he came home the first time at 10 to 11 at 10 50 his Wi-Fi on his phone disconnected from the home router and didn't connect for didn't reconnect for an hour so he was missing for an hour that he wasn't back in school and he was missing for a time period of one hour and also his location services put him in the vicinity of Ellie's house until 11.51. So he was in Ellie's around there for about an hour. And there's also um, like dash cam footage from a bus that saw him in his car driving to or from Ellie's around 11, around 10 to 5 to 11 as well. So he wasn't at home, he wasn't at school. So from him to say, oh, I spent most of the day at home studying or the neighbor saw me brought back to school, it wasn't adding up. It just wasn't adding up. Then they noticed when he got home, when he reconnected to the home router after that hour, he was then disconnected for a full 18 minutes. And so cleverly, so, so cleverly, the police actually did roughly put out a nine minute walk from his house in certain direction. Nine minutes to, nine minutes back. So when they went nine minutes out, they found a bin liner, a, a black bin bag with blood soaked cloths, tea towels, napkins, everything. And they also brought his trainers in, his runners, his trainers that looked like they were splattered with blood as well. These were obviously sent away to the lab for analysis and they came back, this may have happened on the Friday or Saturday, they came back on the Monday and they were confirmed to be Ellie's blood. Therefore, Tom was arrested with regards to first degree murder. The police, they were saying that although the evidence was there, they couldn't actually put him in Ellie's house because what they thought is he actually washed his trainers in the sink after committing the crime. He also wiped, there was blood on the napkins or there was blood on the apron because he had used the knife and tried to wash it or tried to clean it and take his DNA off it. So although they had all this evidence, it was somewhat circumstantial because although his phone was in the area, they can't say it was in a certain house. So like everything, so they had enough evidence, but they didn't think they had enough evidence for it to go to first degree. So it was really the prosecution's trial to win or lose on how they presented the case to the jury and to the judge. So it was the 11th of August, 2019 when it was in the courts and actually Tom turned around and pleaded guilty to the murder of Ellie Gould but then again but now again he had changed his story not only was he admitting that yes he had killed her but his story was he went over to study with Ellie and they got into some disagreement about family not quite sure and that's the last thing he remembers he blacks out and has amnesia and then he woke up or came back to it with Ellie dead and blood everywhere, to which he panicked and tried to clean it up. That was his story. Believable or not, um, there is a psychologist or a psychiatrist, there's a psychologist I think that I watched an interview and they were saying blind rage can cause amnesia. Blind rage can cause amnesia, but it was what he did after. So remember I said that friend got a message around half 11 saying, I don't need a lift, I'm fine. They think Tom, when Ellie was dead, 
took her fingerprint, opened her phone and sent the message to the friend. But not only that, to get himself out and to look like a staged suicide, uh, this is just horrendous and twisted. He cleaned the knife of his fingerprints, put the knife into Ellie's right hand, then reinserted the knife into one of the wounds on her neck to make it look like she had committed suicide herself. So yes, they were saying blind rage can it cause amnesia, but the after effects or the after thoughts per se of what he did, that's cold and that's calculated. That's not blind rage and just amnesia and that's not panic. That is like to use someone's fingerprint to open their phone, no, no, no. So in in November, so, but because he pleaded guilty, it didn't go to trial, of course, because to me, he was a wimp and he knew he'd been, or his solicitors or whoever. So it didn't go to trial. And in November 2019, he was sentenced. Now, Tom was 18 at the time of sentencing, but because he was 17, just a few weeks shy of being 18, um, when he committed the murder, they treated him as a child. So he got life, which is 12 and a half years before he's eligible for parole. And that was pretty shitty. That is pretty shitty. It wasn't even as long as Ellie was alive that he got. And it was really hard. One of the friends, they're all quite young girls. They're probably 19, 20. They're all quite young girls. And one of them was really, she just said, I can remember, all I can remember is a wail from her mum of just desperation of the time he got and she was like I'll never be able to forget that that was one of the worst things and it was just oh heartbreaking but you don't mess with mama bear Carl Gould for the last two years has fought against the system that will let offenders off due to being underage. And in March 2020, the age now it will be taken into consideration and the minimum is 27 years. So this will not affect Tom, but they have been reassured that when he comes up for parole, they will look at the murder, they will look at his case. And the fact that he went from zero to 120 on the violence scale like that makes him probably more dangerous than a lot of criminals out there because it was he had no history of violence no nothing he just snapped and when he snapped he went full on so i think the mum was saying that that's the only consolation is maybe when he does come up for parole they will take that into consideration of the severity and the kind of overcompensation of killing and how far he went to try to cover his own tracks as well. Again, her mom and her friends have fought for that law to be changed. And again, back in March 2020, I think it was, it has been changed. And also they are fighting, and I think this is an amazing thing to do. They're fighting that self-defense classes become mandatory in school. So therefore people may not need to use them, but they have the skills. And a young girl or boy, it could be either or at the end of the day, has the skills to help fight and protect themselves. Ellie Rose Gould, 17 years old when she was killed. So in honor of her, her mom and her friends have continued to fight for her, for justice. And it was Ellie's law that was passed that now can hold criminals, even though if they're under the age up to 27 years. Needless to say, fighting for justice and Ellie's law and everything like that is not going to make bring Ellie back. It's not going to unfortunately erase what her father saw or the pain and hurt that her parents and friends have gone through. But I think through fighting for these different causes, for the law and for the mandatory self-defenses, it's keeping Ellie's spirit and her memory alive in a much more positive way than rather than her being tarnished with she was a 17 year old school girl murdered at home in her home address in the most cruelest fashion. I will keep up to date with this one in case, I know, listen, he was only sentenced in 2020, so it's gonna be a long time before he's even eligible, but it is gonna be something I'll keep an eye on, and just any cases going forward, I'd like to keep an eye, is this, is Ellie's Law really going to take into, into effect underage people who commit such atrocious crimes? And that, my people, is the story of Ellie Rose Gold, the unfortunate 17-year-old schoolgirl who was murdered. So, guys, let me know what you think. But guys, that is going to be my true crime today. It's going to be a short and sweet. 
Remember guys, if you have any true crime or murders or serial killers or anything you want me to look into, don't forget there is a separate email address. It's unforgettablemurders at gmail.com. I will leave it down below if you ever want to get in touch. But yeah, that's gonna be the video for today. I, after this, I am shooting my, I'm gonna do the draw for the winner of the giveaway. I have the unboxings done. I did that last week, but today is the day that I'm going to do the pulling of the name out of the hat. So guys, and I'll probably put that up tomorrow. It's close today, but I'll put up tomorrow because I want to stick to my True Crime Thursdays. Guys, let me know what you think down below. Thumbs up if you like this video. Uh, make sure you've liked, commented, and subscribed. Um, I will have more makeup videos coming. By the way, guys, I do want to say that I hope both Julia is feeling better. I know she's in the hospital, so sending much love, much kisses to you. And Trista hasn't been that well either, so ladies, Look after yourselves and I hope you're being pampered and I hope it brings you a little bit of joy. I know it's murder, it's not going to make me joy but we're all thinking of you girls. So guys, that's going to be me for today. If you've lasted this long, thank you so much for being here. Stay cool, stay calm and wear your goddamn masks. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.